welcome back to the 13th lecture of the course Reinforcement Learning at Paderborn University. Today we're going to introduce additional contemporary algorithms for control, which are based on deep learning techniques and built upon the policy gradient techniques which we just introduced in the last lecture. Namely, today we will discuss these four algorithms here. The first two are deterministic algorithms, which will make use of the deterministic policy gradient theorem, which we just introduced last lecture, namely the deep deterministic policy gradient, short DDPG, and in direct extension to that, the so-called twin delayed deterministic policy gradient, or short TD3. In contrast, we will introduce additionally two algorithms which are based on stochastic policies, which is the trust region policy optimization algorithm, TRPO, and the proximal policy optimization algorithm, TPO. So we have deterministic versus stochastic policies, and we will also see later that these two algorithms are based on off-policy learning with a behavior policy during the exploration, while the two algorithms, TRPO and PPO, are based on on-policy learning since they already come with internal exploration due to its stochastic nature. Okay, let's start with the DDPG algorithm. Okay, what's the DDPG algorithm? The DDPG algorithm is basically inspired by the DQN, by the deep Q learning networks, which had this groundbreaking success for discrete action spaces, for example, in the Atari games scenario, which was here also reported by Min and others. The problem of DQNs are their limitation to discrete action spaces. And this is the, the basic motivation for the DDPG, because the DDPG wanted to extend these uh, successes of the DQN to continuous action. What was the issue with applying DQN to continuous action spaces? The problem is basically the Q learning step, which we just recall here from the uh, DQN algorithm. For that Q learning step, which we need to apply a lot, of course, in DQN, we need to evaluate here our target of that Q learning step. And part of that target is especially that max operator here. So we are searching for the highest possible Q value estimate of the successor state, given some, some samples, for example, in the memory buffer. If this action space is a discrete action space and therefore can be encoded as a subset of the integer numbers, then evaluating this max operator here is, is pretty easy and pretty straightforward because if there are only a few actions possible, then we can just apply exhaustive search. So we basically plug in the first possible action, the second possible action, and so on, and then just evaluate all these 10 or 50 or maybe even 100 possible actions but it's, it's a limited number of them, and then we can just pick that action, which is giving us that maximum Q value estimate here. So that is straightforward and was applied in the DQN context very much. However, if we would like now to extend that idea one-to-one -to, -one to the continuous action space, so where our actions become a subset of the real numbers, where the action itself could be any vector with a dimension up to M, then, of course, evaluating that max operator here, so finding the maximum Q value um, of the successor state, becomes a nonlinear optimization problem if we apply general nonlinear function approximation, for example, by artificial neural network at that point. And then evaluating this max of Q hat for the successor state, this is really a computational demanding problem because we need to apply sophisticated solvers, optimization solvers for this problem here, and they will cost us a lot of computational time. And this operator here, this, this target generation, of course, is also called very frequently in the DQN context. So this is something which we really do not want to do here. And additionally, we have another problem, because if that is a nonlinear function with respect to the action u, and then if we apply standard optimization routines based on gradient descents, again, we have the problem of global optima versus local optima. So maybe we do not get here that global optima of that Q value for the successor state if we really do this optimization. So how do we get rid of that explicit optimization from the previous slide in the DDPG context? 
The idea is to plug in a deterministic policy, which we denote here by mu, and we assume that this deterministic policy is also greedy. And with that greedy assumption, we can therefore approximate this optimization with respect to u by just plugging in mu for u in the successor state. And therefore, we just need to do a very simple inference step here. We just need to infer our policy, so basically an actor. And then, based on this actor inference, we can plug it in. Here in that um, q hat function, we infer then our critic, and we are good to go. And therefore, we could really spare a lot of computational time. So the Q-learning step is basically then done on the actor critic basis and the policy update, the policy improvement step, of course, we need also to take that into account. And we will do that, obviously, due to deterministic policy gradient, because yeah, we have assumed the deterministic policy here. And last lecture, we have also introduced how to apply a deterministic policy gradient. The only difference here is that we will apply it also, or not different, it's, it's basically the same, but we will apply it in an off-policy fashion again, so we will sample uh, certain state action transitions from a behavior policy B, uh, because if mu is a deterministic policy, and let's say that our environment which, which we are interacting with is not uh, very stochastic, then of course we need to get some exploration in the state and action space, and that will be done in policy fashion so using that behavior B, which we will also discuss later on a little bit more in detail. So if we summarize that, DDPG is basically a combination of DQN from lecture 10 and the deep policy gradients from the last lecture 12. Therefore, we have an actor critic approach. So the actor is basically our policy and the critic is our Q learning algorithm part. It is an off-policy approach, as we will also see later, because we need some behavior policy in order to obtain samples and learn something new. And due to this combination of DQN and DPG's idea, the DDPG is applicable to continuous state and actions. However, if we would apply this combination of DQN and DPG in a vanilla way, then we would see that the learning process is not really stable and not really sophisticated. Therefore, we will adduce again several tweaks from which many of them you already know from the DQN. The first one which we will introduce is the experience replay buffer. So we will sample again our tuples here, x, u, r, and x prime. And we will store this experience tuple in a memory buffer d after each transition step so that we can make also use not only of our current transition steps, but also of the transition steps from previous experience. That memory buffer D again will have limited capacity, so it's a type of a ring memory, and when it, once it's full it will basically discard the oldest data samples when we plug in a new tuple. And from this memory buffer then we can design a Q-learning optimization problem, here that loss function, which is based on these targets on the left hand side, and our actual critic which is depending on our parameters w for the critic network which we want to optimize. This mean squared Bellman error which is here denoted as a loss function is basically say the vanilla loss function. However we will see that we will not implement actually this loss function in order to do the critic improvement but we will also modify it in two or three ways on the upcoming slides in order to get an improved the first one is that we will again introduce target networks. The idea here is that we want to separate the new learning targets. And here the bootstrapping as usual. Because in the vanilla implementation as on the previous slide, we have seen that especially here the parameters of the critic W are on the target side, but, but well as also on the critic network side, which we actually want to update. So they depend on each other. But in order to mimic that idea of IIAD generated data as a ground truth in order to perform that supervised learning step for the critic, we introduce again target networks in order to have a separated generation process of the targets here and therefore 
try to stabilize the learning. However, in the DDPG context, we not only have a network for the uh, critic W, but also we have a network which is here for the policy denoted by parameters theta. And actually it turns out that it also makes sense not only to introduce a target for the critic, but also a target for the policy, for the actor, and to use that target policy network also here as a ground uh, truth element for the uh, learning targets. And therefore in the DDPG context, we basically have two target networks, one for the critic W minus and one for the actor theta minus. In the DQN context, basically what we did is we updated these target networks in a hard way. So every couple of update steps, we took W and updated the target network based on the W in a hard way. So we basically override it. However, the DDPG algorithm suggests to do not do that in that hard update way, but in a soft update way in this low pass characteristic here as shown here. So basically in every update step of our policy, we will update our target networks W minus and theta minus a little bit based of course on its old values stored in the target networks. And we will bring in a little update by the current true actor at uh, the current true critic and the current true actor parameter. Therefore this Smoothing parameter or filtering parameter tau is a hyperparameter and normally between or it has to be between 0 and 1. If it would be exactly 1, then this parenthesis would be coming 0 and we would come back to hard updates because we would just update w minus and theta minus based on the w's and thetas of the real actor critic. If on the other side theta would become exactly 0, then we would not really take into account new information from the true critic and from the true actor and we would just basically update w minus based on its old value so there would be no real update we would just save all the old data in the target network so that would be of course also infeasible so therefore now as i said it must be smaller than one but larger than zero and we can consider the general hyperparameter of that algorithm which we need to tune for example, using hyperparameter optimization or just trial and error. Another tweak which we will introduce also with respect to the target networks and with respect to the queue learning step is that we will not use the entire memory buffer, but we will use mini batches. And we will draw these mini batches uh, uniformly from the entire memory D. And therefore we can basically summarize the learning loss function which we actually will try to optimize in the DDPG. So here the targets are then based on the two target networks theta minus and w minus and for this successor state action as denoted at the very beginning we plug in our greedy deterministic policy mu given the policy target network. We will then try to minimize our critic parameters, so w, with respect to that loss function here, that Bellman loss function, based on a mini batch db. Okay. And therefore, this learning step obviously is a supervised learning step within the DDPG algorithm. And at that time, the DDPG was introduced, which was back in 215 and 16, roughly. There was a specific suggestion that the learning step should include batch normalization. So basically, if we have an artificial neural network as a critic, then there should be a recentering and a rescaling of the inputs of that uh, critic on each layer. And this was uh, inspired by a paper which was just uh, shortly announced before the DDPG was uh, getting popular, which was. Um, introduced by Yofi and Segedi, which we also have linked here. But what is the, the, the actual takeaway message here from, from our today's perspective, a couple of years later, is that this optimization step here with respect to new learning, which is the supervised learning step, that this has to be done with respect to the current state of the art of supervised machine learning algorithms. 
Last but not least, another tweak is we need exploration. Of course, in some rare cases, maybe the environment which we are interacting with already brings in enough stochastic influence in order that we do not need to have a specific exploration on the policy side, but let's consider that maybe just an um, exception and that in general we need some exploration based on the algorithm itself. And therefore we introduced, as denoted previously, an exploration um, style based on a behavior policy and the DDPG itself uh, proposed also again to use onstein ullenberg noise, which we uh, already introduced in the deep, uh, in the deterministic policy gradient section of the last lecture. So in that case, we basically have our behavior policy as a stochastic policy based on our deterministic policy, but with additive onstein ullenberg process noise as you know, lambda and sigma are then the hyperparameters of this Ullenberg noise and we can either tune them as constant but of course we could also introduce a schedule for these two parameters for example to introduce rather a lot of noise at the very beginning of the DDPG learning process in order to foster exploration while the uh, noise level might be decreased over time in order to focus exploitation when the learning process is already in an intermediate or near final state. However, this approach here of again using Einstein Ullenberg process noise to do exploration is of course only one possible behavior policy which we can plug in in the DDP algorithm. We could also use other um, noise processes, for example, like just plain Gaussian noise is also considered an alternative in some papers. But of course, we could also plug in here for our behavior policy model-based optimization techniques or expert-based guidance. So it doesn't have to be just that simple additive noise on top of our deterministic policy mu, which we actually want to optimize, but it could be any kind of suitable behavior policy, which is doing the exploration. With that, we now have all elements together, which we need in order to set up the GDPG algorithm. And before we do that in pseudocode, we want to have a bird's eye perspective on a graphical basis. So if you look at this a graphical representation of the DDPG in a simplified form, obviously, we can see that many things are similar to the DQN, which is not very surprising because we said that the DDPG is basically the extension of the uh, DQN towards continuous action space. One distinct difference which we can directly see that we now have an actor critic structure, and therefore we also have two target networks. The policy target network here denoted by Theta minus and the critic target network denoted by W minus. We need then the actor target network together with the critic target network in order to provide the um, targets, the Q value targets, in order to uh, provide here a learning step for the critic. And the critic will then provide basically the gradients or will be part of that gradient calculation which we need. In our policy. From that policies, we can then drive a deterministic policy as our, yeah, let's say, greedy policy. And during the exploration phase, we need to add noise or any kind of other behavior policy here. Simplicity, we just denoted noise in order to do exploration with respect to the actual environment. From that environment, we then again store in our memory buffer the experience tuples x, u, r, and x prime. And we use mini batches in order to perform the critic update and in order to perform the actor update. Yeah, how is the pseudocode looking of the DDPG? What do we need to get started? First, we need, of course, a policy function which to be differentiable and it's deterministic. And we need another approximation function for the action values. That. We need some parameters like step sizes, uh, alpha w and alpha theta for the learning of the critic and of the actor and tau as our update smoothing parameter of that target network update. We need then to initialize our weights for the critic and for the actor and we need to set up and initialize our memory buffer of a certain capacity. What we do then is we, if it's an episodic task for example, we do different episodes, we start somewhere in the state space and then what we do is we apply our actions based 
on either a deterministic policy if, of course, the only if, the environment is already giving us enough exploration due to stochastic impacts, or if that not not the case, which is usually the case, then we need to add noise on that, or we need to into account any other behavior policy. From that action, we will then observe the successor state and the reward. We will save that in the memory buffer, and then from that memory buffer, each time we will sample a mini batch. Of course, only if there are enough elements inside the memory buffer, so we call that a memory warm-up. And then from that memory batch filled with up to B elements, we will calculate the targets first. If the successor state, denoted here as xi plus 1, is terminal, then of course we do not need to bootstrap, because then the target is just the, the current reward which we received for that transition. If that successor state is not terminal, then we apply our bootstrapped target with two networks, target networks, here denoted again by theta minus and w minus. This is in the bootstrapped two target with policy and critic target networks. We can then plug in these targets here in our uh, mean squared Bellman error equation and we want to update our parameters w by minimizing that one based on some mini batch which we already calculated for with step size alpha and as i've said previously this is a supervised learning step so we can just plug in any supervised learning algorithm with state-of-the-art performance to do that when we then have updated the Critic, we go one step further to the actor. The actor is then basically a policy or deterministic policy gradient step as in the last lecture, also um, sampled here from that mini batch. And then finally, the last step is after the critic and the actor has been updated, we also update our target networks in that smooth way, in that um, low pass filter way as denoted a couple of slides before. And this is then basically the entire DDPG algorithm, which we can perform on continuous state and action space. Okay, with that pseudocode, we have summarized the DDPG, and you could, and also will during the exercise, implement the DDPG for a continuous state and action space problem. However, um, the DDPG also has one or two issues or possible improvement points which we will address next in the so-called twin delayed deep deterministic policy gradient algorithm or short TD3 algorithm, which is a direct successor of DDPG and suggests two or three additional tweaks. But before we will introduce that tweaks, we will first discuss the issues which are present in the DDPG and which should be optimized, should be solved by TD3. The first issue which we're going to discuss a little bit more in detail is the overestimation bias or maximization bias and that is something which we already know because that is something which we already discussed in the context of table or queue learning. So if you remember the basic issue was here that if we apply queue learning that our estimates q hats with that greedy maximization will be an overestimate of the true state action values because uh, if there is any stochastic impact in our MDP, in our environment, then if we obtain samples from that environment and we will just optimize with respect to the max, then this uh, sampling of a, a process which has some variance, which has, which has some random impacts, of course, will always take that, that max value, but of course that might be not representative in the mean. So therefore we have that maximization problem. In the context of function approximation, so if we have, a, for example, a deep learning network for a critic, then of course the learning process, the, the function approximator itself, will also address and introduce additional variance to the learning process because the approximation of that Q value by a function approximation is not perfect in any point, and therefore we will have an additional source of variants which can also add up to any stochastic impacts which we might have from the environment point of view. And this problem obviously also exists in the DQN context already. So if we 
apply deep queue networks on discrete action spaces. We didn't discuss that back then. However, the, the argumentation here perfectly also applies for the DQN. And in the DQN case, there was already a direct extension from this double queue learning, which we also discussed in lecture five in the tabular case to functional approximation. And we have also linked you here the, the paper from Van Hasselt and others, which introduced the double DQN, basically just adding a second queue learning network in order to counteract that overestimation bias, which um, yeah is basically the straightforward extension from the table. However, this is pure queue learning, right? So in lecture number five, as as well also here with the uh, DQN, these are pure queue learning approaches and they are not actor critic approaches as the DPG. And therefore on the next couple of slides we will discuss if that problem uh, is also applicable for actor critic algorithm. And for this we will rely on a paper here by Fujimoto and others which have discussed that. And basically they have shown that this is also an issue for, for actor critic and we will give you a sketch why this is also problematic. For this we will Obviously, consider an actor critic policy, which is parameterized by our current policy parameters theta. And then we will discuss two different updates of that policy. First, an update which we denote here by theta tilde, which is a parameter update based on an approximate critic you had. So, basically, our let's say normal DDPG context, we have any approximate critic which um, plugs in its Q value estimates for the actor update. And we will assume that hypothetically we have access to a true value function, which we denote here by Q i, so the true value function. And that true value function could be then used in order to also perform an actor update, which is then denoted as Q star. So basically what we will do then is we will compare two different policy updates. The one policy update towards theta tilde based on our approximate critic with a deterministic policy gradient approach and the second policy update towards theta star based on our hypothetically available true targets, uh, our true critics. Additionally, we will assume that we have a function or a scaling parameter Z1 and Z2, which is able to scale these gradients here both to a unit length, and therefore that the update length, which is given here by these deterministic policy gradients, are the same length, and we will only therefore we only need to take into account the direction of that gradient. So we have taken two policy update steps leading to p tilde and p star, which are associated with theta tilde and theta star. And now we can recall one very important fact. If we do this policy gradient step, this is a local maximization step, right? So we update the policy in that direction of the policy space such that we can maximize our state action values, right? And if you do that, update step with a sufficiently small step size, then we know, okay, there will be, due to the policy gradient theorem from last lecture, we know that there cannot be any better policy in that region locally. And this update of the policy, first year starting with policy P tilde, that was done with respect to the approximate critic, right, with Q hat. So this is a let's say consistent, right? We because we updated p e tilde with respect to q hat, so we know that this update which was performed previously on p e tilde was pointing in that direction where we maximized q hat, right? Because these are let's say policy and critic which have belonged together on the previous. On that right hand side of that inequality. We have the same approximate critic, but now we plug in the true policy, which has been optimized with respect to the true, tr true critic. And this performance, let's say, based here on that approximate state value, must be smaller 
or maximal equal as the state action value uh, denoted on the left hand side because that update here of that policy p star may be pointed towards a different direction in the policy space than the policy denoted here by by p tilde and that cannot be better with respect to the approximate critic because this one utility already pointed to that maximization direction of increasing the estimated critic value and therefore p star cannot be better it can be at max as good as the same of course also applies if we change the roles here so if we look from the true critic points of view and we plug in the true updated policy right then we know that by the policy gradient theorem that policy has been updated if the step has been taken sufficiently small inside the direction where we can maximize u i so the the true critic if you take that same critic but now plug in p tilde so the policy which has been updated towards the maximal region the maximum increase of state action value of the critic of the approximate critic then this might lead into a non-optimal direction with respect to true critic, right? And therefore its state action value cannot be better as the state action value as we would plug in the true policy. So in other words, within that framework, within that viewpoints of the approximate critic and the true critic, there cannot be any better policy gradient update with respect to its own viewpoint. Right, so here we would change on the right hand side, we change the viewpoints, we intermix the uh, approximate critic with the true policy and here vice versa, and that cannot hold. Okay, so we have these two inequalities which basically directly um, are associated, which can be directly derived from the policy gradient theorem from the last lecture. And if we now also take into account, if we assume that the update which we have performed led to that situation by chance. So what is that situation here? That situation says that the approximate critic state action values plugging in the true policy are higher or equal to the true policy through the true critic applied to the true policy. Then so this is basically bringing together these two sides here, the right hand side of 3.17 and the left hand side of 3.18. So if this applies by chance, if that was part of the policy update step that can happen, right? Because we do these, these policy update steps based also on, for example, random samples and the behavior policy and so on. But if that applies, then the two prior inequalities basically directly relate to that the expected approximate critic value applied to that approximate policy updates are larger or equal to the true critic applied to that approximate policy. And this is the important inequality which we wanted to have because this is basically saying, okay, if I would have access to the true critic hypothetically and I do updates on the policy with respect to that approximate critic which I can only do in practice because we do not have access to the true policy then there might be the chance that this approximate critic will overestimate the state action value right so the the true critic here will be in a lower bound but in reality there is a chance that the approximate critic will estimate too high action values compared to a true critic and therefore we can summarize that that maximization bias is also present in actor critic updates. We have shown that based on these two comparisons, just applying the basic ideas of the policy gradient theorem from last lecture. And of course, this error here, this issue might be small for a single update step, but of course it can accumulate over uh, different update steps or yeah, basically the, the policy gradient will then always point towards the direction of an overestimated state action value and therefore that could then sum up and maybe lead to suboptimal policy updates over different times.
So the idea which we have showcased here was for this normalized gradient length, but of course also in the paper from Fujimoto and others, we will find that this also applies to uh, policy gradient update steps where the gradient length is not normalized. Okay, so let's have a little graphical representation of that issue, uh, which is from the same paper as denoted before. And what do we have here? We basically have two test environments from the OpenAI Gym environment collection, robotic style of uh, problems, hopper and walker environment. And what is important from that figure are only the uh, orange lines, orange normal line, let's say DDPG. So this is basically the DDPG as we have just discussed it before. And this true DDPG denoted here by that dotted line, this is basically an DDPG or just a value estimate basically based on sampling. So basically what have been done here is that a thousand episodes has been enrolled using a current policy and then from the replay buffer based on these thousand episodes a specific state value has been estimated just on sampling so we didn't take into account any critic here in order to denote the true ddpg value but just sampling on a sufficiently large episode data set and what we can see from these two example environments is basically that this sampled uh, action value called here true ddpg is much lower roughly 20 to 30 percent lower after the uh, training has been here nearly completed for the two environments so this is already giving some empirical, empirical evidence that the maximization bias is also present here in the ddpg as an actor critic algorithm and significantly also significantly available as i said 20 to 30 percent increase in these two environments and we can also see that the ddpg variance of that learning process here over different episodes over different trials that this is also quite fuzzy so this is quite uh, unreliant and this is of course also something which we would like to get rid of in the learning process because we want to have a learning process of the critic where the variance of course is minimal and we of course want to get rid of that maximum virus and this issue which we have presented here with the variance of the learning process and also the maximization bias of the learning process these are two issues which are uh, related to the ddpg and these twin delayed ddpg which we will now introduce in the next couple of slides tries to counteract these two issues so it wants to reduce the variance and it wants to reduce the maximization before we go into details on the algorithm itself we also want to discuss where that variance comes from, right? We have seen it in the previous picture, but where does it come from? So the issue here is basically that when we apply function approximation and we run our uh, Bellman equation, which we take also as a target for the calculation of the critic loss, then of course the Bellman equation, if we apply function approximation, is not exactly satisfied. So normally we would expect that if we apply uh, here that the Q value is the reward plus a discounted future expected Q value of the successor state. And in the table or case, this was already it, right? We could say, okay, this is a Bellman equation, but in the um, case of function approximation, this approximate um, bootstrapping, which we apply here will not be exact. So there might be some, we call it residual TD error here, which we denote as lambda tilde. And if we apply this Bellman equation and do update steps then over a couple of um, update steps here on the limit with up to infinite number of update steps, then we can see that the uh, approximate uh, Q value will be given by, of course, the discounted future rewards, which is the, the, the standard definition, obviously, but it will also depend on this discounted future CD errors. So this is where does that equation come from? So this is basically just iteratively reapplied this equation for a single time step for two, three, four, and so many time steps up to infinitely number of time steps into the future. And therefore we can say if we would then analyze the, the variance of this estimate, that that variance here is 
given by two parts, right? Because we can separate them here um, in a linear fashion. So that would be then the variance which comes from the environment, basically the the variance of the of the reward, basically plus a variance of the residual TD error or space to the approximate loan. And this is then of course also problematic because they will add up together and increase the variance of the overall critic learning process. And obviously we can see that this is depending also on gamma. If gamma would be small, then of course over time we would discount these residual TDs errors a lot, which would be good in order to reduce variance. But for example, if we are interested in the long-term uh, behavior of our agent, if we want to optimize it for long-term behavior, then yeah, gamma will be large and this problem will also become significant. And of course, which we do not show here as an equation, but which maybe can can think of very intuitively, is if we want to optimize in the critic based on mini batch sampling, that this mini batch sampling also will add additional variance, right? Because we do not take into account, let's say, an, an infinitely large data set, which will give us a very nice um, overview about the state action space, but only mini batches, which will incorporate snapshots limited snapshots of the state action space and these snapshots uh, over different mini batch sampling episodes and will obviously also include variants because they are not perfect samples and representation of the state action okay so that's where the the variants coming in in the actor critic framework of the ddpg okay we can therefore summarize we have two issues with actor critic based ddpg learning which is the maximization bias and the high variance and the TD3 algorithm, the twin delayed DDPG, will now introduce three countermeasures trying to reduce these two issues. The first countermeasure is basically a variant from double Q learning, which is called clipped double Q learning. So similar first to double Q learning, which we will introduce as a second pair of critics. So in total, we have W1 and W2, two critics. And when we perform the Q learning and when we calculate the targets of that Q learning, we will introduce a clipped target. So we will evaluate the Q value estimate for the successor state for the two critic networks, or specifically for the two target critic networks. We still obviously work with target networks here. So W1 minus and W2 minus, and we will take that state action value which is minimal and therefore try to choose that one which is provided as an upper bound of the estimated action value so basically safeguard that estimate towards an upper bound obviously from this min operator from that clipping which we introduce here what could be a result is that we may be Go, let's say in the other direction if we do not do overestimation but underestimation of that action. However, we can argue that if that happens, so if underestimation happens, that this is not as bad as doing overestimation. Why? That's because of the policy updates. The policy updates will amplify overestimation because the policy will try to move towards these overestimated Q values, right? And if we do, in clipping, if you do underestimations, the policy will not move in that direction where that underestimation happened. So it will not be amplified by the policy updates. Therefore, of course, it's not good. It's not ideal, obviously. We still have an issue here, but it is less critical as overestimation. Indirectly, indirectly, due to the min operator, we will also favor those actions which will lead to uh, less variance. So if there are, let's say, two uh, policies which have, let's say, in the average the same Q values, but the one has higher variance, then of course, due to that min operator, we will take those uh, action values which have, higher, uh, which have uh, lower variance. So that's also good in order to counteract that learning variance problem, which we have, discount, uh, which we have discussed on the two um, slides ago. Okay, the second measure is also regarding the policy um, targets. And we basically 
will introduce and regularization, we will smooth out the uh, target policy. The issue here is that the deterministic policy gradients also will run obviously in that direction of maximum Q value estimates. And if there are any peaks, huge peaks maybe in the um, Q domain, then the policy updates will run in that direction. And for the calculation of the targets, we want to prevent that. And how do we do that? We basically do that by adding noise epsilon. We will discuss the noise in the next uh, seconds also to that action of the target policy network uh, of the successor state. So if let's say if here, if that um, deterministic policy tries to exploit some value um, issues in the critic then this additional uh, noise here will flat that out it will try to smooth that out and try to prevent that the policy or also the policy targets will tend to peaks in the action value estimate and this noise here uh, denoted as epsilon is a clipped noise which is sampled from a mean free Gaussian uh, process where the covariance is denoted here by the covariance matrix Sigmar, and we will clip that uh, with clipping constants c and minus c. Okay. Why do we clip that? Yeah, because normally in most applications or in any real world application, the action which we apply here obviously is limited, right? So we have maybe actuators or any kind of, of system boundary where the action is limited to. And so it doesn't make sense to uh, throw in any huge noise here, which might exceed these action limitations. So we clip that. Additionally, just to ensure that the um, actions which are then taken by this additive noise plus the target policies are really within the uh, action constraints, which we assume here are simple box constraints with an upper limit u overline and a lower limit u underline that we will then additionally clip this uh, u prime which is generated here by this clipping with respect to u underline and u overline and therefore we can ensure that this uh, regularized target action here is within the bounds of our system we can then plug this action this modified target policy action in our uh, previously clipped double Q learning approach from the slide on the previous slide and get a, a target which we can use in order to update the critics. So therefore we have two measures which are focused on the critic updates or on how we calculate the targets for the critic updates. Clipping the uh, Q estimates by double Q learning and smoothening the actions of the target policy. The last measure in the TD3 context are then so-called delayed policy updates, pretty much straightforward. Um, here basically what we're going to do is we will also update the target networks with respect to the true critic and um, actors in a continuous way here by these um, hyperparameters tau again. However, we will not do that in every step. Why? It's basically that every time when we perform a policy update, right, we will change the true Q learning targets because if the policy has been updated, the Q learning values have been changed because the policy is a different one. And if we do that um, again and again and again, then of course the critic which tries to estimate the state action values given a policy has no time in order to stabilize itself in order to adapt itself to that new policy to that new state action value space which is generated after a policy update and therefore it is argued in the td3 context that a policy update should not follow after each Q learning update, which was the case in, in DDPG, right? If you remember the pseudo code, we just performed a critic and actor update every time step. For TD3, it is argued that we should not do that and only apply 
a policy update every now and then. So we should update the critic more often than the actor, than doing a policy update. And in the classical TD3 paper, also by, by Fujimoto and others, it is actually suggested to do a one by two ratio. So to update two times the critic and then to update one time the, the actor. But generally, of course, we consider that a general hyperparameter, which we will also see next in the um, pseudocode of the TD. That this delaying of the updates, of the policy updates, is also useful, can be shown here in that a figure from the same paper here is already mentioned by Fujimoto and others, which is based on the Hopper environment from OpenAI Gym. And what we're going to do here is we want to try to estimate the action values on some randomly selected states where either the policy is fixed or where we learn the policy with a one by one update. So every time we change the policy, we also change the critic. If the policy is fixed, yeah, we see that this smoothening parameter tau of the target networks of course has an impact on how we fast we converge to the true value and it also um, shows us that the noise basically due to the learning or the variance due to the learning can be also increased or decreased by a proper choice of tau. So this is a nice behavior let's say especially here for the orange and for the green line we have suitable um, noise levels maybe here the best one would be setting tau to point 0.1 because we have fast convergence and also the noise level around the true value is acceptable. However, if we do the same, so for the same state where we try to estimate the, the average value and we do policy learning where we update the policy every time step, we see that this learning is, is completely going nuts. So we see big differences between the different choices of how, which is interesting in the first place because the idea here of introducing tau was just to smooth the critic um, and, and policy networks and we would not expect to see any direct impact on the let's say average value which can be obtained from that so this is something which we would not expect but which happened when we do the one-to-one uh, -one policy updates and we can also see that the the variance of these values is much much higher and therefore, of course, we cannot do fixed policy learning because, yeah, obviously we want to update our, our policy. We want to improve our policy over time. However, this, let's say, extreme comparison motivates this, um, that there might be a better compromise of doing critic and actor updates as in a one-to-one -one fashion, as um, yeah, denoted on the previous slide, which is basically then giving this name of the delayed policy updates which is here into the TD3 algorithm. Okay, then let's summarize the TD3 algorithm. What do we need? We need our policy function, we need our critic function that is known, we need some parameters. From them the following are new compared to the DDPG. We need a policy update rate which we denote as KW, so KW. So every KW steps we will update actually the policy. And for the target um, calculation we need the target noise for smoothening purpose which was denoted by the covariant sigma and clipping constant c. We have also two critics now which need to be in initialized w1 and w2 with the according uh, target networks. We have our policy target um, and policy target network and our memory buffer so straight forward. Then for a couple of time steps in an episode, we do the usual stuff as also in the DDPG case, no, nothing new. We get actions from some behavior policy normally. We store these actions together with the successor states and reward in our memory buffer X experience. And then from that memory buffer, we sample mini batches. If a successor state in that mini batch is a terminal one, the calculation of the target is straightforward because an Q value is given by the instantaneous reward. In any other case, we need to calculate first that clipped action U prime, which is clipped on that policy actor uh, function here, which is uh, then uh, edited with some mean free Gaussian noise as discussed. We plug in this um, noised action in our target generation, in our target equation. And additionally, 
use our two critics and from that critic we take that one which is giving us a lower q value estimate in order to get an upper bound for q hat and then we can plug in the targets which we have calculated in that way in the normal uh, mean squared bellman um, style of loss function here and optimize the two critics right because we have critic one and critic two denoted here by uh, the two l's basically and optimize the two critics so we have basically to perform two independent uh, supervised learning steps for the two critics independently here then if we have reached one of our update steps kw so if k mod kw is zero then we perform actually a policy gradient step and uh, we also perform the uh, update of target networks with respect of the policy and with respect of the critic so this is in the td3 algorithm in summary in pseudocode and the big differences to the ddpg is basically here the calculation of targets and that we only perform updates on the policy and on the target networks every kw step so with that we have finished this extension of deterministic policies to deep learning with ddpg and td3 and now we will switch a little bit our viewpoint to policies which are stochastic and learned in an on-policy way. And we will discuss uh, there the so-called trust region policy optimization and the proximal policy optimization. So as I said, we will focus stochastic policies. So therefore we will write again our policy function in that stochastic way. So any distribution of a policy given states with some uh, probability of choosing the action to. And if we want to perform uh, stochastic policy gradients on these stochastic policies, of course, we needed to some performance metrics. This is basically just recap from previous lectures. And that performance recap basically was obviously the expected um, discounted uh, future rewards following that policy pi, which we want to optimize. And we will make use of um, representing an updated policy by its advantage function. What was the advantage function? The advantage function is basically the difference between the Q value and the state value being in some certain state and taking the action U. So this is basically how much better it is to take a certain action compared to the uh, policy, which is just taking yeah, its normal way, right? So basically what we can do then is we can compare the performance of an updated policy. So if we update a given policy one step towards uh, P tilde, then the performance of that updated policy will be the performance of the old policy J i plus, let's say, the delta performance, which is depending on that action value given the distribution of our updated policy over the action space weighted over the distribution of the uh, state of the states so p uh, to the power of uh, p tilde x is the distribution uh, of the state space which we get following that new policy so basically if we sum together these two um, integrals here that will be then basically the weighted improvement of the advantages over the state and action space. So we have already considered a similar kind of performance comparison between a new policy and an old policy in the tabular case, right? If you remember our initial uh, policy improvement theorem, and there we could state that if we have a discrete state and actions. Um, that the new policy which we derive is always better or equal than the old one. So we could really say, okay, in, L in every policy update step which we perform, that this inequal inequality would hold. Because we had this, yeah, let's say, tabular case of policy updates where we could change the policy at one cell of our table. So that was straightforward and, and quite easy. However, due to functional approximation, we cannot 
say that this inequality is holding anymore. That was also one of our big uh, discussions for the policy gradient theorem last lecture. And therefore, in some cases within the action space, there we will see that the advantage is negative. So some state action combinations might be enhanced, but other state action parts will be getting poorer in terms of the performance indicated by this inequality. So we will therefore evaluate this equation a little bit more. However, what we are going to do is to evaluate a little bit easier. We want to introduce a local approximation to it. The equation here, which we denote by that local approximation, L, or early L, is really looking the same. The only thing which has changed here is this um, distribution of the state space which we reach uh, given a certain policy. Previously, if you look one slide back, of course the state distribution was given by that new policy, right? Because we will update the policy and this updated policy eventually leads to another uh, state distribution to other states which were reverted over time. However, to make the following calculations a little bit easier, we just neglect that and say, okay, that the policy update will not significantly change the distribution of the states and therefore this weighting in the state space of our uh, improvements of the advantages here can be also calculated with respect to the old policy. You know, that's just e to the power of pi. So therefore, this local approximation gives us yeah, the performance of our new policy utility starting from um, baseline policy pi. So this is the nomenclature two here. So therefore, if two policies, or if we perform the policy update step, and we evaluate that based on a parameterizable and there are the differential policy function p with parameters theta as usual. Obviously, what we can do is that we can say that if this policy update step is sufficiently small, so if theta during the policy update is only changing insignificantly small, then both this local approximation of j and l is basically the same, and also the gradient of that approximation is looking into the same direction, right? So, because if the step size we take, uh, basically we can argue that this change of the policy, uh, state policy distribution will not really change. And therefore for small step sizes, if we try to improve that local approximation here, get it here as uh, L P theta zero. So starting from some initial policy that this will also improve the actual performance J. What is that basically? This is just a recap of the stochastic policy gradient. So nothing new here at that point. However, we do not know really how big that policy gradient step should be. Yeah, we get a direction of the gradient, right? But we do not know how to take that step. If it should be a larger step, it should be a smaller step. Obviously, if we take very small step sizes, tiny, 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 tiny little step sizes, then that is fine because then we know, okay, the policy gradient theorem holds, we take that very small step sizes and in every step size we improve our policy. However, this is uh, only true if the step size is really, really tiny. So we will not really improve our policy much. Actually, we will not change our policy at all, maybe because the step size is so insignificant that it doesn't make any sense. But we also do not have any upper bound on the step size, right? We would like to increase the learning step. We would like to do a learning step as big as possible, where we can still improve the policy without running into a situation where larger parts of the state action spaces run into the problem of negative advantage, right? So this is, this is basically a problem. So from, from this discussion, we basically can conclude that in this stochastic policy gradient framework, we do not have a good metric in order to describe how much we will change the policy distribution if we do a step in the parameter space, right? That's, there is no relation yet. We said, okay, we can do little steps in the parameter space that will change our policy, 
by the policy gradient theorem, it will also improve our policy. But there is no direct link in terms of how much a parameter step will change the policy distribution. And this is, of course, critical, this missing link, because if we would have that link, we could use it in order to try to describe how large our policy update step should get, so how large our learning step should get in order to get the best out of that one update step. And in order to link the parameter space with the policy space, we will introduce a callback library divergence, also called the relative entropy, which we will introduce as your first very generally with Without any specific link to a policy or something like that, uh, introduced as DKL, giving a random distribution, continuous random distribution P and Q, with their probability densities P and Q. And if they are continuous, we need to take into account the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity of Px times the log of Px divided by Q. And this back Leibler divergence, which is here a little bit, let's say, um, maybe not as intuitive as as an equation, will give us an insight in a simplified wording, in a simplified framework, how much a policy will change compared to a baseline policy. So we will later plug in here policy distribution for this general uh, continuous distributions P and Q. And therefore, the kullback leibler divergence will give us a quantity on how much these two policies differ from each other. So that's a simplified interpretation of the kullback leibler divergence, but it helps us to understand why we need it and why it could be beneficial in order to do a, a policy update step, which takes into account the uh, KL divergence. This the definition here of the KL divergence also is um, something which we can really calculate. So, for example, if we assume that P and Q are multivariate Gaussian distributions, which we can denote here by n0 and n1, and the two have same dimensions uh, with the means denoted here by vector mu0 and mu1, and with covariance matrices sigma1 and sigma0, if we then plug in this uh, probability distribution, the uh, probability densities for these two multivariate Gaussian, plug it in here, we can actually calculate the result. And we do not do that here step by step because it would uh, take too much time, but this is basically the, the result of it. And you can see from this result that we first get a scalar quantity, so the KL divergence is always a scalar quantity, which is giving us one um, value in order to describe how much these two distributions change or uh, differ from each other. And uh, for this multivariate Gaussian, it is also interesting to see if the two distributions would be the same. So if these, if these uh, covariance matrices would be equal and if these means would be equal, then what would we have here? We would have yeah, here is zero vector, here is zero vector si times something. So this would be zero. Then here the ln part, so the determinant of these two are equal, so we have here the ln of 1, which will be 0. And what is here? Then we get the inverse of sigma 1 times sigma 2, so this would be the identity matrix, which we get. The trace of the identity matrix is basically the dimension of that identity matrix. And then that dimension is abstracted by the dimension of the multivariate Gaussian, so this entire parenthesis terms get zero. So this is also intuitive. If the two distributions which we compare with each other are equal or very, very equal, then in the limits, the KL divergence tends to zero. And in simple words, if the two distributions are very largely different, then of course the um, KL divergence would increase, would increase. Okay, how do we make use of the KL divergence in terms of a stochastic policy gradient update step? We make use of it by a constraint, by an inequality constraint. So we introduce 
the so-called trust region policy opti optimization by performing the stochastic policy gradient update step or policy improvement step on this local approximation L. So this is basically the normal idea which we have also introduced in the normal stochastic policy gradient step. However, the new policy, which is parameterized by theta, must be within some um, proximity to the old one, which is here denoted by theta k. And this proximity is here denoted by the average KL divergence and bounded by some upper bound kappa. What is that average uh, KL divergence? That is the average KL divergence giving the parameter sets for the policies. Obviously, we can therefore plug in, so this is short notation. We can plug in then the actual policy distributions. And this is in basically here the expected KL divergence giving these two policies, the old one here on the left hand side and the new policy on the right hand side, which we will compare to each other based on samples. So we will approximate this one, this expectation based on samples following the old policy, right? Because these samples following the old policies are available. So we can plug then these samples in here in the KL divergence and can calculate it. Get a scalar value, which we can then compare to that upper bound. So basically this TRPO idea is to perform policy improvement steps under an additional inequality constraint, which is limiting the change of the policy distribution. So this is a improvement, let's say in the parameter space with a limited upper bound of changes in the policy distribution. Yeah, so we therefore limit the average KL divergence with respect to the states visited by the old policies, as I said. And this upper bound here, kappa, is normally a TRP hyperparameter. Um, we also need to tune that. Normally it is considered a small value, significantly lower than one, something around. 0.01 for example, but generally we can also consider it a hyperparameter. So and basically, therefore we have now our link. Here we have an update in our parameter space and here we have a constraint on the policy space in order trying to prevent basically erratic policy changes, right? Because previously with the stochastic policy gradient, we didn't have that link between parameter space and policies. So we could not really say if we do a policy gradient step in that and that direction with that and that length, we do not know how much really the policy changed by that. And we can now limit that policy change by the TRPO idea, which is basically defining so-called trust region. So we can also uh, interpret this inequality constraint as a trust region that we say, okay, within this region of the policy space, we trust our policy update. However, the um, optimization problem, this policy optimization problem, which we have stated here, of course, does not give us a formal convergence guarantee, right? So there is no formal proof at that point of, of point, uh, time when we apply the TRPO style policy updates that this will be a formal guarantee on improving the policy in any step, right? So we, we cannot really... Um, solve that issue that uh, when we apply function approximation to policy updates that um, the policy cannot could get worse actually when we perform a policy update. So we cannot change that. So there's no formal countermeasure against that. But at least we have now a tool at hand trying to reduce the chance that these worsening of a policy is happening due to a policy. Okay. However, to actually solve that, of course, we need samples, right? First of all, we need samples to calculate that average KL divergence here. And of course, we need also samples in order to calculate and uh, set up that uh, local uh, performance indicator here L. And we may, we may make use of this sampling by Monte Carlo rollouts. 
and uh, we will do that basically on the objective function so we expand the previous objective function which is just a recap and if we look at this um, policy um, it's this objective here we can basically say that in terms of optimizing the policy that the first element here the jpk can be dropped why yeah it is a constant right so that's the performance of the old policy which we want to optimize but this policy is already fixed so this is irrelevant for maximizing that local uh, objective function here so it can be dropped then we want to approximate this objective by samplings from that Monte Carlo rollouts since we do not have access to the entire state space we cannot sample the entire state space we have to do different approximations one approximation is that the weighting of the distribution of the of the distribution of visited states of the state space will be approximated by these samplings discounting samplings of the uh, state space visited following that old policy pi and also the improvement let's say in the um, based on that updated policy so this is here the the improvement based on the advantages and giving a, a policy distribution change will be also approximated by the expectation of the new let's say the new policy divided by the old policy so this is basically an important sampling step right why is that important because yeah we basically approximate this integral here on the left hand side based on an old policy which is obviously not the same as that new policy so we have here to uh, rearrange or we have to correct that by important sampling and um, yeah I'm set advantage function so that's straightforward also sampled based on on data we have obtained from the old policy uh, theta k and with that one we can then uh, put everything together and state okay that an approximate objective of our local approximator here l would be this objective so we want to maximize the expected advantage sample based on samples from uh, from the old policy we are giving the new policy distribution which we actually want to optimize and um, then correct it by this important sampling ratio right and this is the objective which we will discuss also next and which we are going to optimize so we can plug that in together with our KL divergence limitation in order to set up in a trpo optimization problem the idea then of trpo is also showcased a little bit here so what is the background of trpo so we said we want to try to increase our policy uh, distribution in a smooth way by the trpo based updates and this idea is in a very simplified abstract version stated here on the left hand side so here we have the action probability on the z axis and on the y and x axis we have different update steps of our policy for a scalar state and action combination to make it depictable here in the figure and if we do the trpo updates right we can see that the policy distribution between the different update steps in the policy space right this is a policy space at which we are looking at the moment we're not looking at the parameter space but at the policy space that this is changing smoothly so we do not have any erratic change in the policy distribution but it's it changes smoothly and at the end we can see okay there seems to be some certain action with high probability which should be taken in order to maximize the state action value so that's that would be let's say a, a example on how trpo should work nice smooth policy updates finding actually an optimal action the counter example if trpo doesn't work or if these trust region updates are not taken into account by vanilla stochastic policy gradients if the step size is chosen too large so if we do too large policy updates what could happen is that the policy distribution between the different update steps here shown on that axis that these change erratic right so we 
see really significant policy changes between the different uh, update steps here. And at the end, this erratic policy changes will then also prevent of finding that action with high probability, which will be optimal for a given state, which is obviously that figures. And this is basically uh, a problem, of course, if we have a standard uh, stochastic policy based updates that if the step size is too large, we can get these erratic policy updates, which leads to, I would call it policy chattering. And on the other side, if we take too small step sizes, then yeah, we actually will take a very long time in order to improve the policy. Okay, so then when we summarize that, what is the TRPO? What do we actually want to do with TRPO? We want to find a new policy denoted by theta k plus one, maximizing our sample-based objective, which was that um, basically here this uh, important sampling ratio times the advantage based on samples on the old policy. Also, we want to combine that with the uh, KL-based um, constraint. And how do we do that? We need a three-step procedure. First, we need that Monte Carlo simulation, that Monte Carlo rollout in order to obtain samples, which we need to approximate the objective as well as the KL divergence. Then we use these data in order to construct actually the specific optimization problem. And then we need to solve the problem. And this is, a, this is really an issue here with TRPO, which is also different from the standard stochastic policy gradient step. So if you remember stochastic policy gradient, what did we do? We calculate the gradient and we just performed a linear update, an incremental update, and that's it. So that was an unconstrained optimization problem. But here with TRPO, where we add this constraint, this inequality constraint, that becomes a constrained optimization problem. So we cannot just perform a simple um, gradient step anymore. That's not possible due to this inequality constraint. So actually what we have to do is after we have constructed in one time step, in one update time step, this optimization problem based on samples of that old policy, we have to give the optimization problem to a solver, to a nonlinear solver, which is able to also handle constraints and solve for theta and then get theta k plus one. And that is, of course, really computational demanding on the one hand side. And in the original TRPO paper, uh, that's more or less a side information here, they have used conjugate gradients with line search algorithms to actually apply an approximation to that problem here. So they actually uh, applied a linear approximation to the objective and a quadratic approximation to that inequality constraint. And with these approximations, then they solved the issue. And they, not they solved the issue, but they solved them the approximate problem. And this is, of course, something which is also counteracting a little bit that idea of these smooth updates in the TRPO, because if you approximate the objective and the constraint, you also, of course, increase the likelihood to do update steps which are erratic again, which basically the thing which we wanted to prevent by TRPO. So therefore, the baseline is we either need to solve that issue with, let's say, very powerful solvers like global optimization solvers, which will take a lot of computational power, or we can take approximations of these objectives and constraints and then use more computational lightweight solvers, which may then also lead to higher risk in, in order to perform updates, which can actually violate that true constraint. So this is something which we need to take into account. Another thing which we need to take into account is that advantage here. So we didn't talk about that. Where comes that advantage from? So we said we need to um, take data from a Monte Carlo rollout and then construct that cost function. here. And of course, therefore, we need to construct A for that different samples. We need to construct the advantages for the different samples. And how do we do that? Yeah, the solution to that problem of the advantage estimation is called the generalized advantage estimator. 
which will make use of data samples, which we have temporarily stored in a memory uh, rollout buffer from that Monte Carlo rollouts following our old policy. And the, actually the actual estimation, which is suggested in the GAE context, is um, this equation here, which is basically summing up our single advantage samples, which we get as a difference here from that bootstrapping idea, TD idea, over as many time steps as we have available, discounted by gamma and discounted additionally by lambda. So first of all, where we get that single advantage sample from, we see here we need to, for example, take into account the state value estimates. Of course, therefore, we need a critic. So we need to feed a critic with that data and also update a critic along the way. And from that critic, we can get the state value information at any time step, giving some sampled return, some sampled reward, and plug it in and calculate delta k. That lambda here is then an additionally exponentially weighting to the advantages, to the single advantages. And the idea is here to reduce the variance along the learning way. However, of course, the lambda will then also insert some bias error. So there is some trade off in terms of the optimal lambda where we trade off bias versus variance. And this equation or the idea of inserting that additional lambda as an exponentially weighted average is something which you should already be familiar with because this equation looks perfectly like the uh, TD lambda equation. However, the only difference is now that we do not estimate uh, the state values with that equation, but that we try to estimate the advantages uh, in any state action combination. So basically, in transfer from TD lambda from state to advantage estimate. And as I said, yeah, there is a trade off uh, of how to design uh, gamma and lambda. If we assume that gamma is fixed, we of course have the opportunity to change lambda in order to trade off the bias and the variance of, uh, of the estimator. And normally, uh, one can say that for lambda, something around 0 0.9, 0 0.95 is always a good default guess. However, we could also consider lambda as a general hyperparameter and then try to fix that hyperparameter Ryland error or by an parameter optimization. Okay, so let's summarize the TAPO so far. So the TAPO tries to constrain the policy distribution changes when updating the policy parameters. It does it in an on-policy learning way because we get the samples from the previous policy of a stochastic policy function. The objective or the motivation of the TAPO is trying to Im improve the policy performance monotonically. So we want to prevent erratic policy changes. And this is done by these trust regions, which are based on the KL divergence. However, there are some hurdles which the TAPO brings in. The first hurdle is that we need to construct that objective function and the constraints by Monte Carlo rollouts. So this will take time. This is time consuming and data efficient because every time when we, um, when we have set up the objective function based on samples, we need to discard the entire rollout buffer. So that rollout buffer is not the same as the um, experience replay buffer in the off policy case, like in DQN or DDPG, because uh, the uh, Monte Carlo rollout buffer is only valid for one update step. And then we have to discard everything because it's on policy learning, right? So this is time consuming and data inefficient because we cannot make multiple use of the data. Then when we actually want to solve the TIPO problem based on this, on this data, we need to set up a nonlinear constraint optimization problem, which we cannot solve anymore just by simple policy gradient ascent. And therefore we need to take into account either approximations to the TRPO problem, which can be then solved with uh, lightweight solvers, or we need to take in heavier solvers like global optimization problem uh, solvers, but of course that will also take a lot of time. So therefore, at that point, we will not really provide you any specific implementation of the TRPO. You can also have a look in the, in the basic TRPO paper, which was also linked the previous slides ago, 
um, if you like uh, to get some details on that. But our statement here at that point is that the TIPO implementation is just too cumbersome because we do not have a good usage of data and to solve a nonlinear constraint optimization problem, every policy update step is something which is really computational demanding. And from the current point of view, looking at computational constraints, nobody would do that. Uh, or let's say not in real application. So therefore we will more or less skip the TAPO implementation at that point and we'll move onwards to a similar algorithm, the PAPO, which we already uh, mentioned previously, the proximal policy uh, optimization which will try to pursue the same goals, so trying to prevent erratic policy changes without running into a constraint optimization problem. So therefore, as I said, PPO, same idea. We try to want to actually optimize this constraint function. So this is just a recap from TIPO. However, we want to get rid of this uh, constraint optimization tasks and therefore we are going to change our objective here in two variants such that this constraint is implicitly inserted into the objective such that we end up with an unconstrained optimization problem and that unconstrained optimization problem can then be solved again with policy gradients with simple policy gradients so we will reformulate that with the same goal, trying to prevent large variations of the policy distribution. And we will discuss two variants in order to do that, that reformulation of the TAPO problem. The first one is clipping the surrogate objective. So surrogate objective is this objective, surrogate with respect to that true TAPO uh, performance function, which we have shown before, because we will, as as previously, we'll sample that objective. So that's a surrogate therefore. And the second variant which we will take into account is a so-called adaptive tuning of a penalty which we will add to that objective uh, based on the uh, KL divergence. Okay, but let's have first a view in that clipping of the surrogate objective. The clipping of the surrogate objective is shown here. It looks a little bit weird. It looks a little bit large, but let's go through it one by one. So uh, first of all, if we look at this um, clipping, we have this big minimization block, which is stretching over the entire expectation here of that objective. And the first element of that minimization block, which we have to take into account, is basically the old TIP objective, right? Here we have the uh, important sampling times the advantage. So this is something which we already know. But on the right-hand side of that minimization block, we have an additional one where we basically clip that important sampling ratio with respect to a regularization parameter, which is called the epsilon, such that the change of policy, which could happen here in P theta, is limited to either one plus P uh, plus epsilon and one minus epsilon depending on if the advantage is positive or negative. We will discuss that on two examples on the next couple of slides to make that clipping here and this, this right-hand term a little bit more vivid. And basically, the entire idea is therefore of this minimization idea together with the clipping here on that right-hand side that to uh, remove any incentive of the policy gradient of moving the policy more than one minus epsilon. So basically that if this important sampling ratio gets too large, so if the policy sampling ratio um, is, is going in the one or the other direction to very large values or very small values, right? If we want to decrease the probability in some state action combinations, or if we want to increase that important sampling ratio during the policy update step, that this is limited. And therefore, we can consider that as a lower bound of the um, unclipped TLPO objective. And obviously, if um, this clipping becomes not active, 
uh, it could also happen that for uh, suitable learning rate that the clipping yeah as i said it becomes not active and actually this clipped surrogate objective would then become the trpo objective but of course it depends on the learning steps okay let's try to make this clipped surrogate objective a little bit more vivid by considering two cases the first case which we will consider as an example so these are now examples so this clipping works is that we assume that we have made some sample or one single sample to be more precise so x and u are now a sample from the state action space and if you calculate the advantage or estimate the advantage for example by that gae that that advantage would be positive okay so what we do then is we we plug in that sample and that positive advantage in our objective function since that is a sample, a single sample, we do not take into account the uh, expectation anymore because it is now specific values, right? So this a is now a specific value and also the x and u for these calculations they are also specific values. So because the advantage is positive, if we apply a policy gradient step, the likelihood of fulfilling a certain action at that point will increase right so e theta at that point ux will increase because we have obtained a positive advantage so we basically can uh, say this action was a good one and we want to take it more often in the future giving that state of that sample here so therefore this importance sampling ratio uh, will be greater than one we want to increase the uh, numerator here and therefore it will become larger than one so therefore we can say here yeah, the new policy likelihood taking action u being instead x will become larger than the old one and if that is larger than one plus epsilon our clipping constant our regularization constant then obviously the clipping here will become constant it will become active right because this will get larger than one and if it's getting larger than one plus epsilon the clipping becomes active and in total the objective therefore reduces to this expression so because if clipping gets active we can say okay that will be not larger than one plus epsilon due to that minimum block and therefore the advantage or the improvement of that objective function will not be greater than one plus epsilon times that sample advantage okay so this will be then the maximum possible objective function evaluation so the the objective value which can come out of that clipped surrogate objective and therefore if we would increase the likelihood here to go into that direction that wouldn't give us any benefit due to that clipping so the interpretation is that a new policy which should be optimized here p theta that does not that this does not benefit from going further than relative to this clipping here and therefore with respect to our previous station should prevent erratic policy distribution changes we can also discuss an advantage example where the advantage sampled from x and u is negative so we can then plug in the negative advantage and that sample point into our objective function which again is now not relevant uh, where the expectation is not relevant anymore and because the advantage is negative right so this is our assumption the advantage is negative that likelihood here of taking action u being instead x for the new policy p pi should become uh, smaller right we want to decrease that likelihood so basically this uh, important sampling ratio becomes uh, smaller than one right it will become smaller than one and if it becomes such small that the new policy is smaller than one minus epsilon times the old policy likelihood of that state action combination then the clipping of course becomes active again right so therefore the entire objective for this example here for that negative advantage example can be limited to that one where comes that max from so let's look here we have a min and now it becomes a max where that's coming from yeah that comes from the advantage because we put 
the advantage in front of that block here, which we want to maximize. And because the advantage, as we said, is a negative value, we can say, aha, okay, minimizing something times the negative value, that is the same as maximizing the, uh, the same one as we put out the negative value in front of that minimization. Okay. And yeah, so basically the maximization block then ensures that the important sampling ratio here, which is calculated, becomes not smaller, not smaller than one minus n. And therefore the interpretation is again more or less the same. The policy update does not benefit from going further than one minus epsilon in terms of that important sampling ratio, because that will not change the objective value here. Okay, so that was the first variant of PPO, clipping of the surrogate objective. And now we come to the second one, which is called the adaptive KL penalty. And what do we do here? It's basically pretty simple and a straightforward trick, which we know in general constraint optimization. What we do is we directly insert our constraint, which was given by the average KL divergence here as a penalty of that sample surrogate objective. So here, the left-hand side, this is the standard objective, as we had it previously. And on the right-hand side, we add our constraint with a weighting factor beta. So we therefore transfer the constraint into an unconstrained problem and penalize any large deviation in terms of the old and new policy distribution. Beta becomes then a weighting factor, as I said, which need to weight the policy improvement against this constraining the policy distribution. And the original PPO paper suggested, that is the adaptive part now, suggested to tune better during learning adaptively so that we do not say, okay, better is some constant parameter which we just define at the, at the beginning of the learning process and, and set it as such, but to adapt it during the learning process. And the idea is that we define, this is now becoming a rather abstract hyperparameter, that we define a suitable targeted value of the KL divergence or of the average KL divergence to be more precise. And if we find out that our sampled averaged KL divergence is smaller than the target value, which we need to, that, that's a value which we need to do defined beforehand, uh, either by trial and error or by hyperparameter optimal. If that applies, then this is, let's say, giving us a sign that, okay, this better, which is currently used, may be too conservative. So maybe we allow larger policy improvement step and therefore say, okay, we want to decrease better, for example, for example by halving it. On the other side, if we see that our averaged and sampled KL divergence is larger than the target value, which we set up at the beginning, then this is an indicator for that these policy gradient steps become too large or have been become too large in the past. So therefore it is concluded that beta would require an increase in order to give more weight to this uh, penalty part. And this update of beta can then be performed any couple of time steps when a new rollout has been obtained from the Monte Carlo. Okay, let's summarize the PPO algorithm on a very high level. What do we need for it? We need a policy network, a stochastic policy network and a critic network now estimating the head. We need the parameters, we need the initialization of the weights and a memory buffer. Then what we do is we will do Monte Carlo rollouts for a number of time steps. That Monte Carlo rollout, that doesn't have to be a full episode. So that could be also a fixed number of time steps, which is less than the number of time steps for an entire episode. It doesn't have to be a full episode. That's why we call it here sub episode. Only if it coincides with the termination of a prior episode, then we actually need to initialize x0. If that is within an episode, then obviously that step here is not relevant. Then we use our current or old policy denoted here by theta j and we obtain experiences by running that policy. We then store these experience tuples in our memory buffer D 
and use the memory buffer plus our current critic estimating v hat in order to calculate the advantages right we need the advantages to set up our objective functions to construct them these advantages can be then estimated for example by the generalized advantage estimator as discussed previously then we have set up our objective function and we can perform a policy gradient step either on the clipped surrogate objective that would be first ppo variant or on the penalized objective function with the kl divergence which is the second variant of the ppo this step is then a classical stochastic policy ascent step as denoted and introduced in lecture 12 so we did not provide you the integrations again um, so you can just apply it as previously discussed then of course we also need to update our critic so we take our memory buffer and update the critic accordingly to minimize the mean squared td errors as usual and then we also need to delete our memory buffer d because as i said this is on policy algorithm therefore these samples which we obtain and save them in the memory buffer d are only valid for that one policy okay let's summarize also some remarks on the ppo first of all in the original paper the authors um, also compared these two ppo uh, variants and there it turns out that for the application scenarios which they took into account that that uh, surrogate objective function was performing better than the additional kl penalty so the objective function 13.26 was reported to be better than the other one the second variant and yeah this is basically also just a reminder to distinguish these memory buffers right so in the dqn ddpg or td3 case we had off policy style memory buffers where we had a rolling replay buffer in an off policy way however trpo and ppo are on policy methods so d here is not the same as in dqn ddpg and td3 but a rolled old buffer which is uh, just valid for one fixed policy and as shown on the previous slide needs to be discarded after a full rollout the rollouts itself of course they are not very data efficient because we have to discard them after a policy update step so this means that in total it is likely that we uh, need more samples so this will put stress either numerically on a simulator model or if we obtain the samples from a real experiment, of course, that may take just more time. And therefore, we can summarize that, yeah, the PPO is simpler than TRPO because we do not have that constraint optimization problem. However, it is, let's say, mimicking that idea of TRPO using multiple heuristics and approximations, and therefore also PAPO doesn't give us any formal guarantee that our policy, which we try to optimize based on the objectives uh, 26 or 27 in the equations, that these will lead to a monotonically increasing performance. So it is an approximate solution on TRPO and it might lead to very nice appealing performance learning curves, but we cannot guarantee that. So we really have to uh, therefore evaluate the ppo performance on the basis of specific application yeah here on that uh, slide we also see an exemplary comparison performance comparison of td3 dpg ppo and trpo with additionally two algorithms which we didn't discuss so far so maybe ignore them for the moment the comparison is based on learning curves for the open a gym and one for some continuous control tasks Baseline here is for these kind of exemplary control tasks that the TD3 in most cases performed best. In most cases here in the inverted pendulum, we actually see that the DDPG improved uh, over TD3. And we can also see that in most cases, the PPO is better than the TAPO, but both algorithms are worse and inferior compared to TD3 and DDPG. However, this is of course only a snapshot out of seven environments, continuous control environments. So one cannot 
derive from this general statement that PPO is always worse than TD3 and so on, but it's giving us some intuition. And as I said on the previous slide, if you have another application where you want to compare these algorithms against each other, you really have to put it to the test by your own. And you will also compare, for example, uh, DDPG and PPO in an exercise on a rocket science problem, uh, according uh, to the Goddard uh, rocket flying problem in the exercise, according to this lecture here. Okay, so with this exemplary comparison, we are more or less nearly done for today. We have discussed so far four very interesting algorithms, two on policy stochastic policies, two off policy deterministic policies. However, there are many other contemporary algorithms which we could also discuss. So there are different, for example, DQN variants which we not discussed, parallelized dueling DQNs, noisy DQN, distributional DQN, or a combination of many DQN variants and extensions in the so-called rainbow algorithm. So these are very interesting algorithms for discrete action spaces, improvements over the classical DQN. Uh, we have linked you all the original papers here, so you can just click, link on, uh, click on these uh, names here and you will be uh, redirected to the original papers. There are also interesting additional um, actor critic algorithms like for continuous state and action spaces like soft actor critic or actor critic using Kronecker factorized trust region. So that would be going in the same directions as TRPO and PPO, a variant to that. Also, these two algorithms have been on the previous slide on the exemplary uh, performance comparison, asynchronous advantage actor critic approaches, which are optimized for distributed computing on high performance computing platforms where uh, simulations of the environment are uh, distributed over thousands or uh, ten thousands of computing nodes. So we could really discuss a lot of these algorithms, but obviously we do not have the time in the lecture. And the, the baseline uh, outlook or the baseline message here for you is that in this lecture, and of course also in the previous lectures in the entire course series, you have now learned many of the important basic building blocks in order to familiarize yourself with uh, algorithms which are derived from the algorithms which we have discussed. So basically, if you're interested in any of those algorithms, just click on that link and you should be able to understand what the authors of these algorithms propose. If you do that, use your knowledge. So uh, really apply what you have learned in this lecture series. And of course, when you are interested in any new algorithm, then please stick to the primary scientific literature for self-studying. So that's why we have also linked you here the original scientific papers proposing these algorithms. So really try to stick with the original scientific literature such that you get the, let's say, information which is uh, double checked, for example, during uh, review processes by peer reviewing. So really stick to the literature which, uh, you can, um, which you can trust and try to not uh, move towards arbitrary blog posts or other unreliable sources. There are also additional repositories which we might want to uh, recommend you for self-learning tutorial style repositories, for example, from Intel, the so-called reinforcement learning coach or the OpenAI spinning up repository. So the nice thing is here that you get um, additional variants of algorithms with specific implementations, either using TensorFlow or PyTorch. So there are some tutorials on how these algorithms works. Many of them we already obtained um, and discussed in the lecture. But the nice thing is, as I said, you directly get here the um, implementations as well as baseline implementations. And if you're interested in ready to go code for application oriented reinforcement learning, there are many repositories with open source code so then let's summarize the today's lecture. What have we done? We have basically transferred the idea of a deep learning from deep cube networks also to continuous action spaces by the DDPG algorithm. We have found that therefore DDPG is a combination of the UN deterministic policy gradients and some tweaks on the basis of policy and value target networks. We have seen that the DDPG as also the normal DQN, 
suffers from value overestimation and high variance during learning. Sample policy gradients might not be optimal, so they might point towards the direction of overrated action values. And we have tried to compensate for that by the so-called twin delayed DDPG or short TD3, which uses clip double Q learning, delayed policy updates and target policy smoothing in order to counteract these issues. These two algorithms are off-policy deterministic policy algorithms and as an alternative to that we have also introduced on-policy stochastic policy uh, reinforcement learning by TIPO which tries to pursue monotonically increasing policy performance by limiting policy distribution changes to a so-called trust regent radical divergence. We have found that the TIPO, however, ends up in a nonlinear constraint optimization problem, which adds up computational complexity in every update step because we cannot perform simple gradient descent on the policies. And we have simplified them or mimic that problem by the proximal policy optimization, but tries to convert the TIPO into an unconstrained optimization problem by two modified objective functions. and the goal is here the same. We want to prevent erratic policy distribution changes with these PAPO's uh, objectives. And with that, I'm done for today. I thank you for your kind attention and have a pleasant week.